I love coming out to the garden and hearing the bees and the other little pollinating insects buzzing about the flowers. It shows that everything's working right. But let's face it, there are some insects that gardeners would just as soon weren't in the garden. I'm Barbara Damrosh. And I'm Elliot Coleman. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll show you how to make insects less of a problem in your garden. On Gardening Naturally. Whoops, that's what every gardener fears. You plant vegetables and the insects are gonna come along and eat them. And it makes us wanna run and get something to spray on them. And even those looking for a natural solution get taken advantage of. I remember a wonderful story about an ad in a gardening magazine and it said the absolute guaranteed natural solution to potato beetles, send in $10. And if you did, a package arrived in the mail that contained two blocks of wood and a little set of directions. And the directions said, Place beetle on block A, smash with block B. Well, <laughs> I guess that is a cure, but I think you can save a great deal of work if you start first with prevention. Come on with me and I'll show you another patch of potatoes. Now these potato plants are only about 100 feet away from the others and they look beautiful. In fact, they look so sensational that my reaction is the same as most people. Golly, if I were an insect, I'd eat these first, they look more delicious. But if you understand nature, that sort of eating of the best isn't what happens. For example, there are a lot of stories of the balance between wolves, a predator, and caribou. And they explain very carefully that the wolf, despite what we may think, cannot catch the healthy, vigorous caribou. It catches the weak and the unfit. And that's the same that's going on in nature here. The really beautiful, well-grown plants are far more resistant to their predators. Is there a reason for this? There's a very good reason, and it has to do with plant stress. The potatoes we saw first were under stress. These aren't under stress. And studies have shown that when plants are under stress, there is a change in the internal composition that makes them far more attractive to insects. The change has to do with the fact that the foliage then contains higher levels of free nitrogen, which is just what insects need to nourish themselves. They're attracted by the effect that stress has on the plants. So how did we lessen the stress on these potatoes? Well, my experience has shown that the stress that most affects potatoes has to do with the soil being too warm and with a fluctuating moisture supply. So what we've done a very simple horticultural practice, we've mulched them. We planted the potatoes normally, and as soon as they bumped ground, then we put on the straw mulch. In this case, we use thick straw. And what this straw mulch does is keep the soil cool and keep the moisture level constant. Just what seems to benefit potatoes. Throughout my approach to the garden, I'm always looking for things that instead of doing something negative to the pest are focused on doing something positive for the plant. I have a number of those to show you in another part of the garden. I'm enjoying myself in the garden. Pest control is only unpleasant when you're doing it as a negative action. And everything I'm gonna do right now is to do positive things for my plants. And the first positive thing I wanna do is create the optimum growing conditions for them. A few hundred years ago, this land was growing a spruce and fir forest in a very acid soil. And those plants were there because this soil was ideally suited to them. Well, right now, I want it to grow a whole wide range of vegetables, and I want to make it just as ideally suited to them. First step, compost. Any time you can spend outside the garden making compost to spread in the garden is the best thing you could possibly do. Not only to get the plants to grow large, beautiful, and tasty, but to up the resistance, because this is the primary natural food, the, the best thing you can spread on the soil. It does so many things at once. In a sandy soil like this, it helps it hold moisture. In a clay soil, it loosens it up. 
it stimulates the bacterial life in the soil, and the bacteria in the soil are things that make everything happen. Now, I mentioned this soil was acid, so my next step is to spread some limestone. Limestone to raise the pH into the range just below neutral, because that's the range at which all the soil bacteria that make everything work down there operate the best. Soil tests have also showed me that my soil is low in phosphorus. So I have some phosphate rock here. This is just a naturally mined form of phosphorus to make sure that the plants growing here won't have any lack of phosphorus. I'm covering all the avenues that make them healthy. Why not put this on in a soluble form? The problem with soluble forms is they're available for a short time and then they aren't available. What we're doing here is creating a system in the soil by getting everything ideal for the bacteria and then the bacteria will make the nutrients available for plants the way they have for millions of years. And then there's one sort of other little insurance policy. This is a dried seaweed product, and plants need trace elements. Now, trace elements are things you may never have heard of, and plants only need in very tiny quantities. Well, every one of them is in seaweed, and the addition of them can make a great deal of difference between a plant that is truly vigorous and healthy and one that's a little off. If it's a little off, if it's under nutrient stress, it won't be growing as well, and it won't be able to defend itself against the insects. Everything here making them stronger and better. If this soil is compacted, no matter how good the nutrients, they won't grow well. So the next step is to make sure that the soil is loose, that I haven't got a hard subsoil under there. Now, I'm not talking about turning it over. I don't want to destroy those natural layers. They're there for a reason. But to make sure that air can get in and keep the roots and the bacteria healthy. I don't want too much water in here. So if I'm in an area like that, I'm going to want to put in some sort of drainage. I don't want too little, so I'm going to make sure I have provision for irrigation to keep the soil moist. Because if the soil isn't moist and the plants don't have water, again, they're under stress. I'm going to put in healthy plants, beautiful, healthy, vigorous plants that can take off and grow. If I put them in from seed and I have a row of little seedlings here, I'm going to want to thin them. Because if they're all close together like this, crowding stress. That's another form of stress they're not going to do well. I'm going to thin them out so they're growing at the distance at which they grow best, have plenty of space for their roots, get plenty of sun, all the things plants need to grow well. If there are too many weeds, that's competition also. And I'm going to want to make sure that I keep the weeds down around these plants so that the weeds aren't competing with them for the nutrients they need to grow strong and healthy. And then there's one last step. It's like when your mom told you to take your vitamins. Here are a couple of vitamins for plants. This is a mix of seaweed and fish, and this is just a, a seaweed solution. They're both emulsions. You dissolve them in water, and you either spray them or water them over your plants. They're not anything that can be used alone, but they're an extra stress reducer in the garden that can really make a difference to growing those beautiful, healthy plants. Now, the nice thing is that you're not alone in this plant protection process. Nature has hundreds of allies out there to help you, beneficial insects, whose role in the natural system is to prey on some of the negative insects that you're concerned about. And Barbara and I handle that by planting borders around our garden of special plants that provide homes for the beneficial insects so they'll be there when we need them. A couple of these products are called Good Bug Blend and Border Patrol, and they contain plants with blossoms that are just the right size and shape so the little insects can nourish themselves on the nectar while they're waiting around for their other prey to show up. In that way, we're sure that they're there and ready to help us. Now, until the system gets organized, there are going to be times when things don't work well. And in a moment, we'll show you some other tricks for keeping pests off your vegetables. When people start seeds at home, they're always warned against a great foe, damping off. Well, it really isn't as much of a problem as you're told. I'll show you an example of it here. I started an exotic melon, and one of them seems to have succumbed, but there's a reason for it. It could be that the soil was too moist. Maybe there wasn't enough sun. I think it was because this was growing in too cool temperatures, where there wasn't quite enough air movement to keep it from getting extra moist around the stem of the plant. What happens is there are fungi in the soil, and they attack around the stem of the plant, weaken the tissues, and cause it to fall over like that. But if you work on designing ideal growing conditions, not too much moisture, plenty of sun, warm enough conditions, 
it shouldn't be a problem, and I really don't worry about it. When I see one, I just pull it out and hope the rest of the flat stays okay. Now we're back with the dreaded potato beetles. Now the safest natural insecticide is my thumb and forefinger. And I can pick off the insects, drop them into a little jar with some soap in it, or squish them in my fingers if I feel like it. The next step beyond that, you can find in your fireplace, wood ashes. And these act as what's called an inert dust pesticide. You sprinkle them over the insects that are bothering you, and what it does, it sticks to the outside of their skeleton, which is covered with wax to keep them from drying out. When they scratch that fine dust off, they scratch off the wax, and they dry out. Another one that works exactly the same way that you can buy at the store is called diatomaceous earth. It is the shells of little microscopic creatures. And again, it bothers the insects, they scratch it off, and they scratch their wax layer off in the process. Now, either one of those you use, remember, any fine dust, put on a dust mask. You want to keep safe. Just because the product is natural doesn't mean it won't bother you. These last two I show you very reluctantly. This is rotenone. This is made from Bacillus thuringiensis, which will give those little green worms on your cabbages a tummy ache. This is actually effective against potato beetles. But they're poisons, and even though natural gardeners use them because they are from nature and will degrade back into it, they're still poisons, and I'm uncomfortable with poisons in the garden. I would much rather look at it from the point of view of prevention rather than cure. And then again, one last point. This may just be cosmetic damage. Studies have shown that soybeans can be defoliated up to 40% and still not lose any yield. So maybe you're acting when you could really sit back and relax. Now next, Barbara has some interesting ideas to show you in the flower garden. I like to encourage as many different kinds of insects to live in my garden as possible. It's going to include a number of beneficial ones that will keep the problem species under control. I do this partly by never reaching for that spray can, this, because if I spray one insect, I'm going to threaten the life of a lot of others as well. Another good way to do this is by having a lot of plant diversity in the garden. Plant diversity leads to insect diversity. So what I try to do is have as many nectar plants blooming at once or all through the season. So there's always a smorgasbord for the bees, the wasps, the butterflies, all the complex web of life that makes it all work. Now that web of life includes not only insects, but sometimes some hopping and crawling things as well. For instance, toads. Now I probably already have some toads in my garden, but I can always use more. One way to encourage toads is by taking little flower pots like this, or perhaps a little bigger, and placing them here and there in the garden, and propping them up with a rock, so a toad can hop in there and hide and feel secure. Now, I can hear some of you saying, yes, but I have a pest that's really all over everything and really doing damage, Japanese beetles. Well, I used to have that problem when I lived in Connecticut. I don't have them this far north in Maine, but I can remember that they could defoliate a rose plant, and really disfigure the blossoms too. Now what my mother used to do in Connecticut was send us all out with jars filled with kerosene. You could use vinegar, soapy water, that would work fine, and just drop them off into the jar. And if you keep after it, every time you go by the rose bush, do it, you really can't keep them under control. Another great method is the vacuum cleaner. It may sound funny, but if you just hold it up to the plant, you can suck off those bugs. If you use one of those cordless dustbuster models, you can go far afield and accomplish that. But don't put out those traps, because I think that half the time they attract more Japanese beetles than they repel. Now, I can hear all of you gardeners out in the Pacific Northwest screaming, what about slugs? They're wiping me out. Yes, that can be a problem. One thing you can do about slugs is pick up a flashlight, go out at night when they're active, and pick them off and kill them. If you're not a nocturnal kind of person, Another way to go about it would just be to garden in great big, tall, raised beds. I've seen them do that out in Oregon and Washington. It won't keep all of them from climbing off, but it will help. You probably have more good slug tips than I do if you live out there. But here's another one. Take a board or a shingle, place it in your garden, let them crawl under there. During the daytime, pick up the board, and then you can pick off the slugs that are hiding there. Now, every now and then, I'll notice that something has been busy on one of the leaves. For instance, look at this hollyhock here. This has been chewed up by somebody. But I have a feeling that it may be somebody that I really want to have in my garden. The Alcea species, of which the hollyhock is a member, is the host for some important butterflies, like the Vanessa species, the painted ladies. 
I love to see those flying around. So, with this minimal amount of damage, I'd certainly rather live with a few holes like that than banish that butterfly from my garden. Another pest of ornamental trees, especially cherry trees, is the tent caterpillar. They don't often do enormous amount of damage, but they're kind of unsightly. So are fall webworms, the ones that make the big fluffy webs at the end of branches and trees. The best way to deal with those is just to break up those nests with a stick, and when the caterpillars fall to the ground, trample them really hard. I know, it's kind of icky work, but it's certainly better than spraying. Aphids can sometimes be a problem, rarely a big one, but there's a tip for that too. I just take a hose, just imagine this plant is infested with aphids. I would spray it like this. This also works for spider mites, which you would more often find on shrubs. When you're spraying for spider mites or anything like this, be sure that you get the undersides of the leaves as well, because that's often where the bugs are apt to be. Sometimes the problem isn't an insect pest, but a disease. I notice that sometimes in August, in hot, muggy weather, my plants develop cases of leaf spot disease or powdery mildew. Sometimes this can be prevented by just growing good, healthy plants with lots of compost and giving them plenty of air circulation, not putting them right up against a wall. With flocks, it might mean thinning the clumps. But sometimes flocks does get all that gray, powdery mildew all over the leaves. Some gardeners use a solution of baking soda and water sprayed on the leaves. But one defense that might work for you is to choose a, a mildew-resistant variety, like this Phlox Miss Lingard. Bee balm is another plant that can get that problem. This one is called Garden View Scarlet, this new plant that's just opening. And that's a mildew-resistant variety. So that might work for you, too. But most of the time, I just ignore powdery mildew and all the other minor blemishes in the garden and just concentrate on keeping my plants good and healthy. A fellow garden inhabitant you may encounter occasionally is the cutworm. And if you do, the damage will look an awful lot like this. Parts of the plant or even the whole stem has been cut off and the plant is lying on the ground. Now I have a, quite a few celeriac planted here and I wasn't expecting trouble so I didn't take precautions. But if I had wanted to take precautions, I might have put a cutworm collar like this around each plant to prevent the cutworm from getting at it. Or simpler yet, I might have taken a couple of toothpicks and stuck one in the ground on either side of the stem. The nice you can remove them, they'll fade into the soil. But when the cutworm comes up to check out the plant, it usually curls around to see if it wants to eat it. And if it encounters hard wood, it decides that's not part of its diet. But when you see this sort of damage, the first thing to do is find the cutworm and send him elsewhere. And if you take your finger, squiggle it around in the soil like this, you'll usually find where it's hidden for the day underneath the ground. I'll let you decide how you're going to dispose of it. We haven't yet exhausted the preventative measures you can take. Three of the best are crop rotation, crop diversity, and timing of sowing. Crop rotation means not planting the same crop in the same place every time. This used to be a bed of lettuce. Now it's a mixture of beets, arugula, spinach, radish, and baby carrots just coming up. And that's crop diversity. Just like out in nature, a mixture of different things is much safer against pests than all of one thing growing together. And the third thing is timing of your sowing. If you're having a problem with leaf miner on spinach or root maggot on beets, plant them early before the pest appears or late after the pest is no longer a problem. All of those will help. And the last thing, just like the window screens on your house to keep pests out of the living room, this material called Agrol P10 is a window screen for your seedlings. You put it on just after you sow the seeds, before they emerge, tuck the edges in, and insects can't penetrate. Your crops are totally safe under there. You can leave this on as long as you want, but if it's a crop like cucumbers that needs insects to pollinate its blossoms, you're going to want to remove this once you see the blossoms form. I want to make an enthusiastic case for a heretofore misunderstood garden friend the bat. In fact, I like ba having bats around the garden so much that I put up bat houses. Why? Because bats eat insects. Lots of them. Now, a bat house looks somewhat like a birdhouse, except for an interesting difference. The bottom is open, and the bats come in from the bottom, and there are dividers in here. 
dividers for small bats and for larger bats. And there are also little ridges on the edge so they can hold on with their claws. The best thing about bats is that they are out all night flying around and eating insects. Insects that'll bother your garden, insects that'll bother you as the gardener. They love mosquitoes. And so you may never see them. They sleep during the day, but they're some of the best bug patrol friends you could possibly have. Now, I'm gonna put this up in a tree. I'm gonna put it about 12 feet high on a tree that is open in the front so there aren't branches that will keep the bats from flying in and in a place where it overlooks the garden. That's the best place to have it. Now, I may not have bats in here immediately. It may even take up to a year before the first inhabitants come. But that's okay. By putting these up, I let bats know that they have a friend here and that I'm looking forward to providing housing for them. And when they do come, don't be afraid of them. They are not a scary creature. They are a wonderful little creature. They're part of a natural system, and they will eat more insects than you can imagine. It's important to remember, if you do use a natural pesticide, to use it as a tool, not as a weapon. The points to stress are all the preventative measures that we've shown throughout this program. And you know, a lot of the insects around here are so beautiful. They're really the jewels that ornament my garden. So I want my garden to be a place where they can feel at home. That's right. As Santa Zuberi wrote, one must endure a few caterpillars if one wishes to enjoy the butterflies. And that's our show. For now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how.